Welcome everyone, welcome to the fifth Pachacucha Thistle Macedonia Thress event. Um, it's always lots of fun and I hope it's going to be lots of fun this year too. Um, it's my second experience emceeing this event and I have to tell you that this year it was different from last year, very much different. And I'm going to tell you in a minute why. Well, last year I was told yeah, you're going to do it. Why not? I'm a fan of Pachacucha. So I agreed immediately. And then I had to ask people around, would you be willing to do a Pachacucha? What is it? I explained, oh, no, please, no way. I had to send emails to presenters like, please, would you be willing to present? After a lot of struggle and a lot of email exchange, I managed to convince eight great presenters to participate in the event. This year, I was prepared for a similar challenge, but about it in a minute. First, I would like us to remember what it was like last year and two years ago. Okay? So I've prepared a short video for you. Uh, you will see some familiar faces. Let's start with that. Pekka Kucha? <laughs> Pachekacha 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 Good evening everyone. I'm gonna start with um, this controversy of global dimensions, which is the pronunciation of this very term. Some people pronounce it Pachakucha, others Pachachka. But if you could read this tiny print here, you would say that it says, for advanced learners, Pachachka. I'm advanced enough to pronounce it Pachachka. That's what I'm going to do. Hello, Margarita. Hello. Hello, Tessa Macedonia Thrace. My name is Noriko. I'm Achiko. I'm Keiko. We are all Japanese native speakers, and we would like to help you solve this controversy of global dimensions. The pronunciation of the term is It turns out that the longer does not necessarily mean the better. Because there are many serious consequences if you beat around the bush, develop a point forever, talk too much about things, you should be more concise, more specific and speak to the point to avoid this kind of outcome. The good news is that there is life after PowerPoint death. 20 slides and each slide lasting only 20 seconds and the slides advance automatically, which means that you have to be very well prepared. And the most important challenge is that you need to focus in a very specific way, <laughs> that you need to know exactly what you're going to talk about. And if you do not know that you are really stressed, that's why I'm so relaxed, because I know what I'm talking about today. I'm going to talk to you about my hobbies. One of my big hobbies is reading, but I also have lots of other hobbies. And today I'm going to tell you about the books that I currently have on my Amazon reading list. <laughs> Hobbies and pets. What about knitting with dog hair? If you can't, you know, these are hard times. If you can't afford to buy wool, why not get some off the dog and knit with the dog hair? Your dog, of course, will be very stressed when you've done that, so you'll need doga, yoga for dogs, just to chill the dog out after you've taken all its hair. Is your dog gay? <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. I, d I haven't got a dog. I've got two rats. They don't seem gay, but they may be. Now, does God ever speak through cats? It's a question that I've asked myself many times. The conclusion I have to say is probably not. Ah, toilets. What's your poo telling you? Probably not a lot. All these books are available on Amazon. Do it yourself, Coffins. So these are all books connected to my hobby. This is my Amazon reading list. And if you'd like to log on to Amazon and look for me, you could actually gift me one of these books. They're Everybody's doing a brand new dance now. Come on, baby, do the Pecha Coochie. Really got a rhythm if you give it a chance now. Do the Pecha Coochie. It's got a bit of rhythm and a lot of soul. Give a little bit of rhythm and a lot of soul. So come on, come on, do the Pecha Coochie with me. Moth World, a poem by David A. Hill, illustrated with his own photographs. <laughs> 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 
Perhaps you do not know the world of moths. Come on, baby, do the Pechacucci. On the twin. On the 20th annual conference of Tissol Macedonia Thrace, I saw it fit to devote 20 slides on the 20 years of OTA. This is a trip down memory lane to reminiscent, understand and notice change. In these years we've all changed, but there is one thing that remains unchanged. We are here. The journey starts in 1993. The success was not a happy accident. It was the result of the ingenuity, resourcefulness, and managerial abilities of the people who have been at the helm of RTA. So thank you, Roger, Mariana, Karen, Paul, Elena, Mike, Chrissy, Andy, and Julia. I too am a member of this Old Macedonia Thrace, where my teacher's voice can be heard. Films. So Kieran, where are you? I guess your time starts now. Films which can be used in the English language classroom. This Four Weddings and a Funeral is one of my favourite films. I'm not a huge Hugh Grant fan, but uh, th this film I like very, very much. The slide is not changing. I thought it was going to change. It's, like it's changing. Okay. So one of the funniest scenes here is Mr. Bean, and I feel a little bit like Mr. Bean at the moment, because in this, he's so nervous, he's making mistakes, and I think that's what's going to happen with me uh, today. Who are the English? What is this puzzling species? Where does it live? What are its habits? In Cornwall, their people are polite and thoughtful. They take care of your body and your soul. Uh, when it's hot, please dress for the body you have, not the body you want. Thanks. Hello. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a love story. It's a story full of passion and hatred and love. It's the adventures of the day, well, the adventures I had ever since I met project-based learning. Ever had one of those days when you work really hard, you're sitting at the staff room, another director of study barges in and says, we're going pebble. And you think, pebble? Going on the beach? Great. No, you silly guy, the person sitting next to you digs you in, one in and says, project-based learning. Project what? All right, you think, projects. I've done millions of projects. They're everywhere, ever since I was a student. And suddenly you start panicking because you realize you've got to teach grammar, vocabulary, do reading exercises, do practice tests, oh my God, and do PBL. Aren't these too many pebbles in your basket? Why do you do all this? Uh, we just want our kids to get the certificate, you know, this paper that goes framed on the wall. Uh, so get a book and some CDs and just teach. If you do 100 tests with them, then they will pass the exam. And it's like somebody comes and tells me I'm hungry. And I say, okay, I'll give you the ingredients and I'm going to teach you how to cook so you won't be uh, hungry for the rest of your life. And they say, no, 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 I just want a hamburger. Well. I'm not exactly against hamburgers. I mean, no, I meant certificates. Hamburgers are great too. The students know that you care. These are a handful. They drive me crazy. But one time they came and they told me, they asked me, Miss, can, you call, can we call you mom? And I said, why, how come can you, will you call me mom? And they said, okay, because you shout at us sometimes, like our moms do, but uh, you really care if we learn. I'm warning you, my presentation is not funny. Yeah, I thought I'd give you a glimpse of my uh, teaching adventures. Every year in September, I get a big surprise just like that. When I find out I'm getting a post in Thessaloniki, and I go, wow, yeah. Well, this year, guess what? The surprise was even bigger, because I found out that I had to work at three schools. This meant three things, a lot of commuting, and uh, a lot of teaching, different levels, you know, it makes me feel like I'm a Mary Poppins uh, because I never get to teach at the same school twice. Did you know that the term Pecha Kucha comes from the Greek language? The word Pecha means crust and the word Kucha means standing on one leg. Thus, the term Pecha Kucha is used to describe presentations that 
only scratch the surface and do not provide an in-depth and balanced analysis. Creativity sets us free. Creativity takes courage, uh, as Matisse said. Life is not about waiting for the storm to pass by, learning to dance in the rain. That's the whole point. We must not be stable because creativity gives us the wings to feel like that and to be happy all the time. Tick tock ticks the clock. Tick tock, it never stops. Tick tock bets my heart. My very first Pachatka, let me start. When is their boat time and they cannot fall asleep? Storytelling is the answer, not counting sheep. <laughs> Pachekacha. So, so that was 2013 and 2014 uh, selection. High standards to be met by this year's presenters. And here they are. Rakesh, Marjorie, Dimitris, Danny, Joe and Nathan. Let's start with Rakesh. Well, I told you that this year was different than last year. Last year I had to send one million emails, ask, would you please be so kind? Please present, it's not difficult. You're not risking your life. And this year I met Rakesh in Slovenia at a conference. And I said, Rakesh, we are having a Pachakcha event again. Would you like to present? Yes, he said. And he was telling, yes, you did. And last night, he was telling somebody at the table when we were having dinner that it is all my thought, but he, because he was not even planning to come to this conference. And here he is, Rakesh. I hope my voice doesn't give up on me. That's her side of the story. She actually, she actually twisted my arm. <laughs> And the arm twisting comprise looking at me very sweetly and flashing her eyes lids up and down <laughs> to which I couldn't say no. So <clears throat> I was duped, seduced, somehow manipulated into coming here. I hope so. This is only my second uh, ever Petakucha. And I'm not sure about the we Greek dress code. Am I no, supposed no, no. to have one of these? Is, there, like that? is, that, is that how uh, the Greeks do it? Ten. Yes? Okay, so now, ten when ten in ten Athens or? Oh. <laughs> You're preempting my uh, Pecha Kucha because it's slightly um, <clears throat> not pornographic, erotic. Is it starting? No. Oh, okay. Uh, this Pecha Kucha was inspired when I went to stay with my friend Vicky uh, about 10 days ago, because she was here last year, I think. And I was telling her about a very famous dictionary. None of the Pecha Kuchas have talked about dictionaries. Mine is all about dictionaries. And so by the end of this expostulation, I looked it up in the dictionary, big word, uh, you will not be able to uh, look at or listen to the English language ever in the same way again. There are lots of dictionaries. Uh, you probably know the, one of the most famous ones, Dr. Johnson's, published in 1755. There are all sorts of other dictionaries which you might have, the Oxford English, the Webster's. There are bilingual dictionaries, technical dictionaries, and so on. But there's also ah, the Devil's Dictionary and the Urban Dictionary, but I'm going to talk to you about the Turban Dictionary. This doesn't exist. It does exist, but under the, a different name. But let me tell you, tell you why I call it the Turban. I come from Punjab, which is the land of five rivers. But the word Punjab can be Punjab or Punjab. So I'm going to jab you with some of my puns. There was a Greek pun there, which those of you who are clever might have... Did you get it? The tailor, Euripides? Yes, Eumenides? Okay. So puns have been around for ages. Here I'm quoting definitions from Ambrose Beers, who wrote the Devil's Dictionary. These are his defi de <coughs> definitions. To save my voice, I'm going to let you read these definitions yourself. And in his Devil's Dictionary, he has lots of cynical definitions. So here are some relevant to Greece. Again, <coughs> you can read those yourself. Philosophy. I'm sorry, Vasiliki. You see here. 
Um, yes. Well, yeah. okay. This is going much faster than I, I want. So, <laughs> the Greeks apparently invented democracy, and here are some more cynical definitions from uh, the Devil's Dictionary. And I apologise about the last question, which is an English joke. What's a Greek urn? Not much nowadays, and I apologise for that. Okay, some more uh, definitions from the Devil's Dictionary. Um, I, I'm very familiar with some of these definitions, like love. Uh, I've suffered from this temporary insanity twice, uh, but managed to get out of it. The medicine is called divorce. Okay, uh, here are some other medical definitions. As you can see, they're all very cynical and rely on the meaning of the word. Uh, <clears throat> the last one, funeral. In Ireland, they call it awake. And you sit all night with the, with the dead body in case he wakes up. That's why it's called the wake. So, uh, most of uh, the devil's dictionary definitions rely on semantics. But sometimes, occasionally, it re re relies on spelling as well. So, Hebrew, a male Jew, as distinguished from a Shebrew, a female Jew. Okay? Um, so, he's beginning to look at the sounds of words and not just the meanings. So, here are the differences between the Devil's Dictionary and the Turban Dictionary. In the, the Devil's Dictionary, a pygmy is defined thus. So, you quickly read what a pygmy is. It's a tribe with very small people. But in the Turban Dictionary, pygmy is a way of telling the waiter, I'll have the pork, please. Pig, me. Okay, you missed the last one, which was a la carte. A la carte. Don't ask for the a la carte, because you know what it is? You'll have to think a bit more uh, esoterically. A la carte is a Muslim wheelbarrow. Come on. A la carte. Okay, you got it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so these are all definitions which I haven't invented. They're all in the Uxbridge Dictionary. So adultery is what comes after puberty, apparently. Uh, syntax is the, uh, a charge uh, levied by the government for doing naughty things. Um, I'm sure this is going much faster than I want. <laughs> paintings, paintings, if you're from Jamaica, they're not things you hang in an art gallery. They are things that cause you pain. Pain things. Dreadlocks, nothing to do with Jamaica. It's a fear of canal holidays. Are you, are you keeping up with me? Okay. Injury, so this might be esoteric. I think only Ken will understand this. I Ian Drury and the blockheads, okay. And if you're sick of my bad jokes, you, you probably want to go on an inquest. That's the search for public houses. And when you get there, uh, you... Oh. <laughs> Look, because it's going so fast, I'll let you read these yourself. Okay? See if you can work them out. Can you, can you read them from the back? <clears throat> my, my favorite one is beware. Okay, pistol, pistol is a government charge for urination. You have to think very quickly now. Uh, phantom is when you waft some air over a male cat. Pick a lily is easy. Pick a lily, pick a flower. Uh, a load of old baloney, that's what you think. Baloney, baloney is sort of an Irish word, which means loco loco. But baloney is the, this bone here, below your knee, the shin bone, okay? Uh, the others you can work out. Rampart, any part of a male sheep. Uh, the last one, depending on how you pronounce it, is rodent droppings. Rat. Okay. Uh, now, do you dig it all? Digital. If you were born in the hippie era, the word dig was very popular. So, delegate, because I come from India, I thought I'd throw in something about Delhi, Watergate, Iran Gate. Delegate. Ah, sorry, I'm getting a bit uh, naughty here. Excrete it is no longer a Greek island. <laughs> uh, se semitry, well, a semi is half, it's half a tree. Um, magistrate, it means Madge is not a lesbian. <laughs> okay, much to my chagrin, this is the last of my uh, slides. And I'm not going to tell you what the dictionary definition of uh, those red words are. 
but uh, by now you've got the idea. If you want to look, look up more of these words, go to the dictionary. Okay. Can I just give you the last one? The word, you saw the word sexual. It's what, a, according to the dictionary, what a prostitute in Louisiana shouts to get customers. Sexual. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you so much. Now, Marjorie. When Marjorie first agreed to be our plenary speakers, we were delighted. And then she agreed to do one workshop. And then she agreed to do another workshop. And then I told Effie. I said, Effie, where are you, Effie? Effie? I said, Effie, should we ask Marjorie to do a pachacucha? Effie says, no, I feel too embarrassed to ask because she's already doing so much. I said, just, we have nothing to lose. Go ahead and ask her. And Marjorie said, no, I'm overwhelmed, right? I can't take this on. And then I go to Slovenia. That was a very good trip, I guess, okay? And I meet Marjorie in person. And I say, like, we are having this Pachakuche event. Would you like to prepare a presentation? I'll think about it, she says. And in the evening, she tells me, I've got almost all the slides ready in my mind, all the images, I know what I'm going to do. And here she is with us trying something new because it's her first Pachakuche. Thank you for doing this. Okay, so, yes, we're going to talk about the very serious side of ELT. We all know that ELT is something to be taken seriously. We have important jobs which affect future generations, so it is not a laughing matter by any stretch of the imagination. And for that reason, I am very glad to have this time to express my opinion on this subject. So who are we serious about? Obviously, our incredibly attentive students, our very friendly colleagues, <laughs> our wonderfully supportive bosses, the unbelievably well-informed Ministry of Education, and our extremely understanding family and friends. And our students. What makes our job so wonderful is that our students are always awake, attentive, wouldn't dream of using their phones during class or doing anything except listening to us and working hard when we ask them to and homework is always done correctly and delivered on time. So what do students say? I can't come today, are you doing anything important? Thank you so much for letting me know. Since you won't be here, I've decided we'll just spend the time watching videos of adorable kittens. So no, you won't miss anything important. Is it a problem if I miss class next week? A problem? Not for me. If you're not here, we might actually get through some of the material in this class of 25, 30, 35 students. Actually, you never need to come to class, so it's fine with me if you miss for the rest of the semester. No one told me about the homework. Oh, I am so sorry. I didn't realize you didn't know about it. Perhaps next time I could prepare breakfast, bring it to your flat, explain the homework, help you, and then stay to wash up afterwards. Would that work? Then there are colleagues. <laughs> We have colleagues sitting by the phone waiting for us to phone with questions. They never spend any time doing anything else. They just hope that we're going to phone and say, could you give me five or 10, 15 minutes or perhaps several hours of your time? And they have questions like, could you send me your lesson plan? I didn't have time to do one. Oh dear, I'd plan to spend the day relaxing at my in-ground pool as I never have much to do, but I could put that off indefinitely so I can spend a few more hours working. I don't want you to feel overloaded. I never had a problem with that group. Really? Interesting. I'm sure you didn't. When I got them, they complained that I actually expected them to do something. They had so much fun with you. So I guess I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I can find out what you did and continue it exactly the same way. Then there's our bosses, those friendly and understanding people who have a firm grasp of what goes on in the classroom at all times. After all, they are the experts and they always know what to do in every situation, don't they? 
And what do they say to us at times? What do you mean you're sick? Well, I've just seen the doctor here at the hospital, and I promise that the moment I am no longer highly contagious, I will be back at work. I certainly wouldn't want to let you down. That would be awful. Your students sing too loudly in the music lesson. Oh, so sorry you were disappointed in the lesson. I'd hope to do something much more dramatic, like set the classroom on fire, like the pupils did at the school down the road last week. I'll really try to do better next time. And then we have the wonderful and transparent Ministry of Education. These open institutions are completely up to date on what teachers face every day, right? They try to understand the latest methods and challenges and their comments when approving school books to authors for schools are spot on. The unit's unrealistic. You can't send photos through email. Oh, gee, I guess I'll forget about all this technology I've learned to use and purchased. I'll go back to printing photos from negatives, putting them in an envelope, and mailing them. Thanks for the great tip. In the new technology unit, you need to add an HD, or high-density, TV. Really? I didn't know that HD doesn't mean high-definition, but instead is a TV that's somehow connected to high-density uh, polyethylene used in plastics or old floppy disks. Who knew? This text is full of mis... Take us. Hmm. Really, guess the spell checker didn't do its job. And we weren't planning on editing, but we're considering a text similar to the report we received. Our final goal was to produce something like the book you can see below. You found us out. Then there's our family and friends who totally understand that we all need to work. So we could all join in in hi ho, hi ho, it's off to work we go as they realize we have no time on Friday evening or Saturday morning or Sunday afternoon. Not to mention their comments. Well, if you ask me, wow, that is such a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Sure, I can try that out with a group of 10-year-olds, 16-year-olds, university students, corporate clients. Take your pick. And. Why don't you finish all your work before you come home? <laughs> what a great idea. I could just prepare everything, do my research, and my marking during class. I don't know why I never tried that before. Brilliant. Thanks. You're the best. And final thoughts. But at the end of the day, everyone knows why we do this job. After all, with the salaries we're paid and all our days off, we really just spend most of the time in paradise, relaxing under a palm tree. Isn't that true? <laughs> and I hope you noticed that 99% of the photos were taken from ELT Picks. <laughs> Thank you so much. The next presenter, ladies and gentlemen, is not here. He's not with us today. He is watching. Yeah, let me say it. <laughs> uh, Dimitris Primaris, he presented his Pachakucha for us last year. And you saw some samples of his presentation about uh, project-based learning in the video that we pro projected earlier. So Dimitris, because of some health issues, could not come here, but he's watching us. Hello, Dimitri. Say hi to Dimitri. Hi, Dimitri. So he's watching us, and he has sent us the recording of his presentation. Are we ready for this? Ah, no. I have to say how it all started. Yeah, with Dimitri, it was a very difficult story. It was very difficult to convince him to do a Pachakucha this year. I'll tell you what happened. Last year, he presented, and he sent me a message like a couple of days later. Can I present the next year, too? So that was that tough. So that's how I got him convinced. Okay, Dimitris Primaris. Hello, my name is Dimitris Primaris. Today I would like to talk to you about the challenges and opportunities of education on the cloud. 
as I experienced them through a European project and my work at school. I think I can see you wondering, talking about clouds in a country that adores the sun, the cloud is actually a metaphor for using the internet in a variety of fields ranging from business to education. But what is a cloud? Let's see what Wikipedia says. Cloud computing involves deploying groups of remote servers and software networks that allow centralized data storage and online access to computer services or resources. Hmm, that's quite missed, isn't it? In simple English, educators and learners can access and share data. They can communicate through the internet in a much more convenient, organized, faster and safer way than in the past. As long as there is internet access, one can learn anywhere, whether at home, on the bus, on the beach, knowledge can be accessed through your personal device very easily. Are you an early bird or a night owl? No worries, it won't make a difference anymore. Simply because one can access content 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. I think I can guess your next question. How may education on the cloud affect our daily teaching practice? Well, let's think of the prospect in terms of homework, feedback, collaboration and communication, different learning styles and methodology. To start with, no more allegations that the dog ate the homework. Of course, you may get the odd lame excuse that the file was lost or that the internet was down. But generally speaking, they can't escape. Your students can receive personalized feedback in the form of text, audio, video, or a combination of all these. In this way, you can give feedback in the most discreet way. Your students can broaden their horizons and practice their English by communicating with students and educational experts from abroad with a single tap on their tablets. If sharing students' work in the past required mountains of photocopies and permission from a disapproving director of studies, now it can be done electronically, in real time, online, even by absent students who are at home. Through platforms such as learning management systems, Moodles or MOOCs, you can provide specific resources for specific types of learners, such as video, visual material, educational games, audio, animation or any kind of remedial work you think they need. In terms of methodology, you can set personalized goals for individuals alongside class goals. You can provide special resources and extra practice material, for instance for an individual learner who needs to improve her listening skills. And for renovative teachers, you can spend more time in class working with on projects with your students than lecturing monotonously by posting your presentation on the cloud in the form of video or a PowerPoint presentation with your voice recorded. It's not all cloudless though. Infrastructure cost, installation and maintenance, security, can be a headache. 
So make sure that all your investments are cost effective. One of the most popular approaches is to ask your students to bring their own devices. Uh, this often causes problems of compatibility with different operating systems. Opting for cross-platform applications can save you time and effort. We often take it for granted that our students are digital natives and they know how to behave online. But we need to remember that we are the ones who will set the rules and instill values and principles. And finally, are we ready to adjust our teaching? Are we ready to relinquish our role as authorities? And are we ready to facilitate autonomous learning? No. This cloud is not raining cats and dogs, but it's raining more opportunities for learning for a wider range of learners who are eager to learn and want to achieve more in their life. If every cloud has a silver lining, then make the most of this cloud silver lining to your students' benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitri. <laughs> okay, now Danny. Danny comes next. So with Danny, it took me quite a while, but I didn't have to insist. So um, we, were, we have been Facebook friends for some time, and because he is a presenter, so we talked about our convention, what he might do when he comes. And I said, I also said that we have this Pachakuche evening, would you be willing to present? Yes, send me a link, send me a sample. And then he just said, I'll go for it. So, go for it. Okay, the subject, as you can see, is laughter yoga. There are many benefits of it. Uh, first one is that it decreases stress and you sleep much better. Um, Improves breathing, breathing and helps you lose weight and look young, as you can see from my example. Um, also reduces heart disease and uh, it's a natural painkiller without any side effects. And there are many other benefits of laughter yoga too, which are not on the slide. Uh, there are many kinds of laughs, <laughs> which... Uh, this thing working? Yeah, it's definitely more than 20 seconds. Yeah. Two minutes. <coughs> okay, just wait for it to change patiently. Okay, uh, this is the welcome laugh, uh, which is the one I usually use at the beginning of a session. This guy in the picture here is named Zoran. This was taken at the 2013 Slovenian ITAFOL uh, conference. And one thing to notice in this picture is that his one powerful laugh has got every single person in that picture at least smiling, if not laughing out loud. This is the B laugh. Um, we'll be doing these laughs tomorrow, by the way, in, my, in the practical session. Um, as you can see, again, everybody here is uh, quite actively involved. And um, there are actually over... Uh, a thousand laughs uh, which exist in all the different laughter yoga clubs around the world. This is the elephant laugh, another one we'll be doing tomorrow. Um, and uh, this, uh, this one here, as you can see, is uh, also quite fun. Um, 
My favourite laugh uh, is the next one coming up, which is called the, uh, the milkshake laugh. Uh, here it is. This was taken in one of our cl many clubs in Rome, in a, in a kindergarten school, as you can see, lovely background there. Um, and uh, we, again, we'll be doing that one tomorrow too. Um, however, there are some laughs which we won't be doing tomorrow because uh, they're a bit more, let's say, intimate, like this one, which is the uh, belly button laugh, where you get the vibration from one person's belly to another person's head, and it goes right through. It uh, just takes one person to laugh, and you can feel the vibration going right through. Um, these are all qualified laughter yoga conductors. This is an international uh, congress. This one also is another intimate laugh. is the canoe laugh, and this was taken at uh, Roma Club again um, last year. And um, one of the things people ask me is, okay, you do your laughter yoga in your English lesson, but what do you then do with your students after that? Um, well, I then get my students to do lots of things. I got some primary kids here in Sicily to, uh, to make some group statues. This was one of my favorite uh, ones they came up with. Um, it does make you more creative uh, and more uh, open to different kinds of learning. Uh, and then uh, in the summer, I was teaching in, um, in a summer campus in the UK, and I was trying to get them to make words with the body. I don't know if you can actually identify what the word is here. Can you identify it? Yeah, the V is misbehaving, but yeah, it should be lo love. Um, and then I had a very lazy group of students who were just lying around in the sun, and I thought they weren't working, but in fact, they told me that this is a word. You can probably guess it. They've made it image style. There's the smile and the two eyes. So again, if you're creative, you can uh, come up with anything. So I'll give them credit for that. Um, and then uh, from, uh, from that, uh, from those activities, uh, there's also the uh, hugging, which is something I do a lot of, walking around the street with my free hugs banner. This is uh, a lady selling glasses in a shop in the middle of Rome that I came across. And uh, I also bring hugs into the uh, lesson too. And going back to that summer campus, uh, we did some tree hugging, <laughs> which is uh, here with some uh, Russian kids. Uh, which they quite enjoyed. Again, nice warm summer day in, in England. Um, so, uh, yeah, hugging is uh, very beneficial and it needs to be done for at least 20 seconds to have the uh, benefits that it's supposed to have. Um, not the three seconds, which is the average normally. This is a conference in Sicily and Catania with 600 state school teachers. Uh, the hall actually holds 400, so some, many of them are standing up. And I'm actually getting them to do the milkshake laugh in this uh, shot. And there, as you can see, most of them are actively involved in the, uh, in the laugh. This is the uh, Lisbon European Laughter Yoga Congress in November 2013. And you can see the effect of having lots and lots of people because it makes it a very uh, contagious uh, effect. Okay, I had a workshop at this conference, and this was, these were the people I had after two minutes of the conference. I put on a bit of music to warm them up, and I came and I thought, what the hell are you guys doing? Uh, this was one of the photos, it was just unbelievable. These again, they've been laughing together for three or four days, so they're already in a kind of crazy mood. Uh, I won the first prize for best makeup as well. Uh, the girl who's a professional face painter saw my Pink Panther tie and decided she would paint my whole face with the Pink Panther style, as you can see. Didn't even recognize myself. And um, that's a butterfly who's uh, with me. And uh, I had time to yogi around Lisbon as well, um, basically making a fool of myself, as I usually do. Okay, this is the national convention in Italy. Uh, we're actually the biggest uh, growing country at the moment uh, in Europe. And everybody here is doing the lion laugh, which is very, very good if you suffer from thyroid. We'll do that again tomorrow as well. Um, so this said was our national meeting 2013. Big group photo. This is me with my red nose. This was taken at the Gold Age uh, Festival, which is a festival for over 50s proposing activities. We had our laughter yoga stand there too. 
This is my Facebook picture as well. Some of you might recognize it. And uh, finally, I think the last one should be a uh, kind of a mix of some of the pictures uh, put together. So um, this is the after yoga presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, Joe. Yes. Yours is going to be the shortest introduction. One day I receive a Facebook message which says, Hi Margarita, count me in for Pachacucha. Yep, I have no idea why. That's all she said. It was just a quick decision, I guess. Thank you, Margarita. So, hello. My name is Joe, and I suffer from digital filming and other phobias. I'll just list some of them here. It all started a year ago when I had the cheek to take on the presentation of the project that George and I run with our students. And here are the greatest of all. Number one. Yes, go on. <laughs> Is it about two minutes again? <laughs> Is it stuck? Uh, okay. Tibisildrophobia, aka, you, aka YouTube. I find it uh, terrifying to follow instructions and upload a video on YouTube. I spent hours, nights in front of the screen just to wait uh, for a video to upload. I watched, I stared with terror. Cataractophobia, aka a Pirate Bay uh, Torrents. Uh, one of my greatest secret uh, wishes is to become the Jack Sparrow of the uh, World Wide Web. But then again, if I download illegally, will I become the Godiva of antisocial behavior? Hypotitrophobia, subtitling, me having to add uh, uh, text to my video, not a chance. Have you ever followed instructions on YouTube? Then you must be the new Einstein of the day. The uh, Stephen Hawking's of the digital universe. Edophobia, me having to edit a video, no, uh, not a chance. Uh, uh, copy and uh, copy, uh, paste, uh, copy and paste, cut and clip. Uh, uh, I'm a really, uh, it is a dreadful thought. Uh, things go to the wrong places. Opiso Muros Musicophobia. Okay, I just said it. I, want, I wonder which torturer came up with this uh, word. It's adding background music uh, to my video. Um, uh, it is uh, unlikely, most unlikely, and uh, the music just pops up at the most unsuitable moments. Photophobia. My camera is never steady. I tremble and I shiver, and the outcome is a blare. Um, my shoulders go numb, and uh, my fingers really hurt, and I really sympathize with all the professional camera persons, yes, politically correct as well, Nathan and Margarita. Echophobia, the fear of forgetting to switch on the microphone when I uh, realize, shocked, that I, have, I haven't switched on the microphone and I have to do the recording again and my sweet voice and uh, those of the others is not <laughs> recorded. Miss Anglophobia, not uh, the fear of the wrong uh, Englishman, but that of taking photos from pictures from the wrong ankle. I really hate the moment when the others tell me, Joe, you make me look dreadful from that ankle. At that point, I'm so close to hurling the camera at them and leaving. Synchronophobia, synchronizing video and sound. One opens their mouth and you hear them 10 seconds later. Uh, that's, uh, that's really uh, dreadful. It's one of those child shopping movies when the viewers tried to uh, fathom what the uh, actors were uttering. Chronometrophobia, so many things to say and add in the, this application. How many seconds left, you said? Three, 30 minutes? <laughs> it really kills me. And, um, and the clock is ticking. And should I put my hands over my ears so I won't hear the boom of my demise. Lentisophobia, the, the fear of forgetting to take off the lens cap. Has it ever happened to you? You finish with your video session, very glad with yourself, just to realize that the lens cap was on all the time and you have to do the shooting again. 
the filming shooting. I mean, not pe killing people. <laughs> okay, some people call me Napoleon, but my interruptophobia, the fear of getting sidetracked, side is really extreme. What if some budget's in and everything goes to waste and I have to do the recording again? Uh, and uh, the wrong motorbike, exo uh, motorbike exhaust, and I have to do it again. Post-sumophobia, not these li lovely chub, uh, chubs with their tight undies, but that of having to repeat the shooting. It really kills me because of this, all these misfortunes I have mentioned before. <laughs> <laughs> Scriptophobia, all this thing, remembering these myriad lines, one word is forgotten and cows and shoes in their heads. At that point, I'm willing and ready to tear and chew the script, kill the scriptwriter, and shake the actors from their shoulders. Yes, Margarita, I know that my PowerPoint should be ready by now. <laughs> oh, well, these bosses, these uh, Petra Kutcher organizers are so demanding. Not, not, not the slightest chance to give you to, uh, to procrastinate, zip your coffee, browse the net, enjoy the sunlight. And yes, I suffer from applicophobia. Which application? Why? Uh, I dare to Google the question and a trillion options appear. I just sit there scrolling up and down the pages. As simple as that. Opistohomophobia, okay. <laughs> Well, the scene should be set. Mm. Have you got the foggiest how many parameters there are? I asked a fellow professional and only a mathematician could analyze the sheer scale of the number. And yes, frigophobia, the fear of freezing and not knowing when to start. This is Dimitris Pribalis, we and uh, myself, we had to do a, uh, an interview last year at the convention. And the camera person started shooting, and we just stood there staring at each other, not knowing when to start. Quite awkward, I would say. And of course, <laughs> Petra Kutsophobia. But I think I have just overcome it. So thank you for bearing with me and my phobias. Uh, please, a big applause for George Raptopoulos. Stand up, George. He is the torturer. He has been my amateur psychotherapist this year and who came up with this long, strong twister, words for phobias. Thank you. So that was the beginning of March. I had my five presenters, the ones that have presented so far. And we, and we had this board meeting. And I say, okay, so how are the preparations for the Pachacacha going? I said, just fine, yeah, but I still need one person because, okay, five will not be enough. I need one more, I need six people. And then Nathan turns around and says, I'll do it. So that was that easy this year, okay? Nathan. Thank you, Margarita. Okay. Um, unfortunately, mine's not as funny as everyone else's. I'm going back to basics. So, are we ready? I'm going to start with some of my passions. You all know me for photography. A few of you know me for motorbikes and also my cuddling of other bikers. Uh, my love for football, especially uh, any sports. My love of farming and my love of video games and 3D design. And it'll go in a minute. I admit, I am a nerd. I play flight simulators. I play space simulators. I play truck simulators. I play medieval simulators, I play space engineering games, I play many other games. Uh, anything, really. <laughs> I am a gamer. Um, now, there's a wide variety of game genres. There is the role-playing games, there's the first-person shooter games, there's the strategy simulation games, there is simulation games which you can do anything in, and there's also the massively multiplayer online games. Uh, as I said, I'm an avid gamer. I started back in 1984 with the Acorn Electron, which was the baby of the BBC. I then moved to the Commodore 64, and in 1994, I had my first PC. And it was a dinosaur. 
One of my most memorable games that actually got me into gaming in 1984 was David Brabham's Elite. This was a space simulator, flight sim, uh, and it was the first to introduce the sandbox genre. Basically, you could do anything, and it became a cult hit. Just before Christmas, David Brabham re-released it as Elite Dangerous and brought it into the 21st century. Gone was the wireframe graphics, in came the true-to-life graphics and simulation. There's many games that can be used as an education tool. Recently, Minecraft was announced. It's being given away to every Northern Ireland secondary school. It was part of their Culture Tech Festival. Why? Just why are they giving games to schools to use? Minecraft was quickly recognized for its educational potential because it offers children compelling ways of learning about architecture, agriculture, and renewable resources, as well as how to solve the horrible creepers that appear at night, if anyone has played Minecraft. Personally, I don't play Minecraft. I've played it a couple of times, I didn't like it. I play engineering games, medieval engineering or space engineering. With uh, space engineering, you have to go and find the resources before you can build anything. And I mean, you have to mine it. Then you have to turn it into ingots. Then you have to turn it into other things. Another space-oriented game that is used, being used in education is Kerbal Space Program. Uh, it's a game based on a fictional world called Kerbin. And your aim is to get the Kerbals into space. This game can be used to teach children in physics and maths at higher levels, but it can be also be used at any age level uh, to demonstrate physics concepts and motiv uh, motivate students to engineer creative solutions through experimentation. Coming back to Earth, we have simulators such as Farming Simulator 2015. I actually work closely with the developers of this game anyway. Uh, this game, you can you basically run the farm, you drive the tractors, you drive the combines, you plow and plant the fields, you harvest it, you feed the animals, you, you do everything that you would do on a farm. So uh, here a child can learn the process of growing crops and looking after livestock in a hands-on situation. They drive the tractors and every other farming equipment and can upgrade them as they earn money. And even a friend of mine made a map for the game and put in Pratt's Poultry Food. <laughs> so, um, multi mul massively multiplayer online games um, is great. They playing with friends can be fun, and here we have the four of the major ones: Guild Wars 2, Eve Online, World of Warcraft, and Star Wars: The Old Republic. In an MMO, you can learn social skills along with teamwork, problem solving. And skill, pro uh, skill progression also plays a big role. It teaches you how you progress in life. <clears throat> and it'll change, right. Going away from the PC, I'm a PC gamer. Uh, we have the consoles. Consoles are also good as an educational tool. You'll be surprised. Um, we'll change in a minute. <laughs> Games such as Guitar Hero and Rock Band promote the development of hand-eye coordination and rhythm skills. There is also an element of teamwork when they play with friends, so they have multiple guitars or the drums and singing along and having a good, good laugh. <clears throat> Modern consoles are also a great way to teach fitness and health. The Xbox have the Kinect system. The PlayStation have the Move system and the Wii has the or what they call it, the Motion Plus Remote. <clears throat> all the consoles have similar games in their collection. They all provide various sports and fitness options, not just for children, but for adults also. And finally, 
I am a gamer, not because I don't have a life, but because, because I choose to have many. Thank you, Nathan, and I would like to thank all the presenters for their presentations today. And I would like to thank you all for being with us today.